Hi everyone, welcome today to the GDC Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. I am the invisible voice inside your head. Um, I am here today, uh, joined as always by some of the wonderful folks who make the games that you get to play uh, in your spare time. Um, in the lower left hand corner of the screen, I am joined by Albert Shi, who is the lead designer on the game we are checking out today, which is Superliminal. Uh, Albert, how are you doing? Uh, good, yeah. Hello everyone. Um... Yeah, thanks for kind of inviting me to do this. Right on. Um, if you uh, are not familiar with Superliminal, you uh, are probably looking at the screen right now and wondering just exactly what's happening. Why am I picking up this cheese? Um, uh, you, I'm picking up this cheese because I'm going to turn this cheese into the ramp just by turning around. Um, uh, Superliminal is a puzzle game uh, currently out on the Epic Game Store where uh, it uses your force perspective to change the size of objects or sometimes the, uh, um, the nature of objects. As you can see, this cheese has gone from being the size of a hand to the size of a ramp. Um, Albert, how long have you all been working on this game? And I guess when did you sort of first come up with the idea for it? Yeah, so it's been a while. I think right now it kind of tallies around like six years or so of course you know i haven't been working on it you know full time the entire time but it began when i was a student and i needed like a student project to do you know for the end of the year um so i just made this like tiny little demo uh you know with just with this one mechanic and like three puzzles and mm -hmm. and you know a couple years after that we found more people and then more people and finally you know we have a team of six six or seven people uh when we ship the game so yeah right on um just for a quick uh, housekeeping check in with chat uh we got folks like christopher lloyd watching thank you for joining us chris um uh we will be taking your questions if you have them for albert um i guess the first uh question worth worth uh asking is so how does this perspective mechanic actually work um, and how were we able to build it out to fill out uh, all these puzzles? Yeah, so the general idea of, you know, when I explain it is things are the same size on on your screen, but in space it, it actually kind of adapts to, what you know, how large it seems to be, right? And mm -hmm. it's all based off the idea of like, oh, if you pretend to, you know, pinch the Tower of Pisa, uh, it looks that it looks like it should be you know a certain size and so in this game you just try to fulfill that you know illusion uh in game however how it actually works to keep it consistent is uh, the object that you're grabbing will be as large as possible and as far as possible as it can always be um so it's always you know uh it's projected kind of like as as far uh to the distance so if there's a wall behind it we'll try to find the point on the wall that you know it'll be, be before it kind of collides with anything mm -hmm. um and then just through that mechanic then people can use that to solve puzzles mm -hmm. uh and what was the second part to your question oh i guess how did you start building out puzzles around this mechanic oh yeah so that you know the kind of history of this project has been a long one so uh there was a long process you know to get there but it, it started out like there were different phases right like mm -hmm. it wasn't um we just started out and, and just kind of went full throttle and just uh did a bunch of stuff i think one of the first big kind of uh milestones was you know uh, i knew that like this, this thing called the sense of wonder night it's like it's basically you know, it's similar to the Experimental Gameplay Showcase, but it's at the Tokyo Game Show. I knew that was coming up. up. I was like, great. Well, what if I try to, like, flesh out this mechanic that has, like, two puzzles, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from there, I just kind of uh, tried, tried to think of, like, the wackiest ideas I could use it for and just made one puzzle each. And that, you know, became a series of things that then, you know, slowly grew and grew. Mm-hmm. Right on. Um, what was kind of uh, uh, building on that question? What What do you think makes a good puzzle? Like this is such a um, this is such a mechanic that defies how people think. Although it sort of naturally fits into it, also naturally fits into how people think, like perceiving the object to be the size it is, as opposed to understanding it's not that size. Um, how did you? What was your philosophy for coming up with puzzles? And what do you think makes it interesting to solve puzzles with this mechanic? Yeah. So I think. I think a lot of that is kind of like 
based on people's personal taste. Um, there's a lot of different types of puzzle games. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that I found the most interesting was kind of like anti-chamber, you know, puzzle games that were more about seeing something new and trying to think outside the box as opposed to, you know, something, you know, like a Sudoku puzzle, right? Which is, you know, all the mechanics, you know, all the elements, but it's more about, about mastery. It's more about like a series of steps. Um, so I definitely try to try to focus on uh, finding ways that would give players, you know, different types of epiphanies mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, and that's why, and that's why, you know, if some people play this game, they might say like, oh, hey, you know, it's not necessarily like scratching like the mastery itch, but there's like a lot of really cool and interesting stuff in it. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, that's an interesting response. Uh, the epiphany um, angle kind of reminds me of Portal 2 about how you'd sort of be shooting portals at things for a while. Um, yeah. And I really like, I should have disclosed, um, the video we're watching today, we're, lo we're looking at today, is not entirely, it's not live. Uh, I had to pre-record this footage so that we could make this stream happen. Um, but you're going to get, I like it because then we get to watch all the little epiphanies that me of yesterday had. Like the <laughs> one right there where I discovered that I could actually pick up the, the sign. Um, yeah. Uh, Speaking of, yeah, speaking of Portal, I think, like, one of the most interesting parts of Portal 1 that, you know, I was like, wow, this is really cool, is when you realize momentum works through, through portals, right? Yeah. So, like, that's the kind of thing that we're like, you know, can can we repeat this? Is it even possible to do? Um, and And that's what we try to shoot for, so... Yeah, it's kind of the same thing here, right? Like instead of momentum, it's size. It's instead of momentum, it's size. Like you, like I can take this little sign and I can make it big and I can make it small. Um, yeah, and that that's what lets me solve the puzzle we're looking at right here. Um, moving on, uh, and just also giving a quick shout out to Yassi Man. Uh, thanks for dropping by. And we'd love to. Ooh. Light recognition on your completion of the Oh, we briefly lost you there, Albert. Are you back? Oh. I was getting some strange noises from Skype. That's fine. Um, uh, uh, Albert, we're gonna see this. We're gonna see this game sort of. I, we're actually inter approaching an interesting point of the game, which is where the puzzles stop being just sort of test chambers like Portal, and you start to do that Portal esque thing where you go outside the test chambers and outside the simulated environments and start solving puzzles in a way that sort of feel like you're breaking the game you're you're, you're quote unquote breaking the game even though you're not mm -hmm. you know you're just yeah. solving the puzzle stuff the, the puzzle is just now outside the narrative space a bit um how do you did you notice anything while designing these particular puzzles about how players approach them and if they struggled in any specific way with when the puzzles began sort of to not be um i guess presented in the same kind of structure yeah i think it's definitely um I think it helps with this game because mm -hmm. there's so many weird things we try to do even early on. Mm -hmm. So, so, and also I think there's it's part of kind of the shared language, right? Like people have played Portal and other weird games like this. So, when when usually they they you, they see this, they're not like, oh, this is like I'm totally confused. They're more like, oh yeah, I, I knew something was coming, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in in general in games, as long as you kind of set up. Uh, expectation you can get away with anything mm -hmm. um you know some people say in puzzle games like a lot of people talk about like oh how difficult should a puzzle game be but i really think it depends on kind of what expectations you set right like in dark souls is a very difficult game but if you know that going in and if everything about the game tells you that this is going to be a hard game mm -hmm. then you get used to that and and you're not you don't feel uh, that sense of like uh, unfairness, right? Mm -hmm. So I think similarly with any type of puzzle game, as long as you set the expectations correctly and you say things are going to be weird or like oh you have to, you know, think outside the box a lot, then uh, it won't seem as jarring when you do weird things. If that, that makes sense. That's kind of the difference between a, a, a an epiphany driven game like this and a. Um... You mentioned a Sudoku puzzle game. Like if you imagine an app for Sudoku games or or, or like a even a match three puzzler, um, those are sort of in very constrained environments where you're trying to use the tools you have to to solve a new kind of a puzzle you already know. But in this game, um, the environments are not constrained. Uh, they they aren't just like they're set pieces, but they're not. Uh, you're you're sort of not always told that there's just one way out. I guess um, right, which is what yeah. create, what makes it easy for players like me here. 
to start solving problems <laughs> based on that. And yeah, I took and the soda can for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things we try to encourage is we want kind of like the space to be interest interesting enough that people will want to look around and, and be like, oh, what is this? What is this? Is is this you know part of the puzzle? Is this something you know? Because mm-hmm. then that it makes the space feel a lot more more alive as opposed to just like I'm going from point A to point B. I don't need to care about anything between you know. Mm-hmm. Like you're playing around with with things here. You're looking around at different kinds of things.、Um, That's why we we try to add on little surprises or little things that you could discover if you go out of you know off the be- beaten path.、Mm-hmm. God, these moments really screw with <laughs> me right here because they're not puzzle moments. These moments, they're、yeah. just optical illusions. Yeah. How do you、um, how God how do you even implement this? How do you like use Unity and go okay? I need this to look real over here, but I need it to look really fake over here. Yeah. So it's it's you know some of it is surprisingly simple, and some of the hard parts are are like. Surprisingly hard. The easy part is if you're just trying to do like a, a a simple projection that looks like something else. You just have a camera stacked on a projector, right? The camera takes the image and the projector spits out the image.、Mm-hmm. Uh, the hard part is actually where you know like depth is involved、um, because the projectors in Unity don't have depth. So、uh, we actually have a graphics programmer called Phil who's like really good at this kind of stuff. He basically、uh, hacks some kind of、uh, light related system that uses, you know, shadow maps and whatever、um, that ends up, you know, taking into account for depth and all that. But that like extra step turned out to be much harder than just kind of the original prototypes we're doing. Yeah, how does the resizing work while I'm at it? I guess like, what's the what what kind of game logic are you using to make make the resizing possible? Yeah, so so again, it, it's like the easy parts seem hard and the hard parts seem easy.、Uh, the easy part is, is actually like how do things look exactly the same? The rules that is, is surprisingly simple. It's like if something is twice as far away, it gets twice as big, and、mm-hmm. then vice versa. And that just for some reason, you know, with computer with computer, and it's like you no, know, it's very、uh, specific. Math, it just works.、Uh, so, and it's weird. It works in like different FOVs, whatever. I don't know why, but it just ha- it just does. The hard part is actually finding how far the object should go. Because、mm-hmm. if you imagine like you have a very weirdly shaped object, like let's say you have a sponge, right, and、mm-hmm. it has tons of holes in it, and maybe you have a background that's really complicated, and you want to make sure it doesn't kind of clip into any of the background. So we just it's We did a lot of like trial and error, and it's just like a very dense、uh, layer of raycast that we're doing to more or less estimate where it should land.、Mm-hmm. And even if it's like a little bit off, it's a little bit、uh, closer than it should be. It's it's fine, but as long as long as it doesn't feel、uh, unfair. Right on.、Um, this is a really interesting puzzle right here, and, and I'm going to be stuck here for a while. But the、um, the reason I'm not skipping over.、Uh... This video is the problem-solving process is sort of illuminated for what I was trying to do.、Um, what's interesting is going on right now is I assumed that the、uh, that there was just an angle I needed to view the cube at, like the last、yeah. thing I did, but、mm-hmm. I wasn't. And I and I thought I looked at there and I can see okay, one lamp is styled like the box that must be part of it, and、ah. that strange gap over there must be another lamp. That's that's all I thought was, it was just, <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to how I can see it now. It's clear as day. The lamps are clearly.、Um, On the the raised out parts of the walls, I just did not see that when I was playing.、Um, it's going to take me a minute for the past me to catch up, but in the meantime, I guess.、Um, uh, oh God, I just walked right by the solution. <laughs> I, <saw it. laughs>、um, I guess in the meantime,、um, what happened? What when, in play testing? I'm sure moments like this happen on every puzzle.、Um, what was kind of your approach for? Oh, and here I am, just trying to use the last puzzle solution to get through this one.、Um, what was sort of your?、Uh, Response when players would enter moments like this, where they just miss the thing that they make an assumption and they miss something, even though they they should not be making that assumption. Yeah.、Um, usually, I'm actually a little bit happy when players like miss the most obvious things because、mm-hmm. I think that's a good case because you know, like a player like you, even if you you miss it, eventually you'll look around enough that you'll find it, right?、Mm-hmm. I think the opposite case actually that.、Um, Is when players go in the room and they immediately figure it out,、mm-hmm. and that is,、uh, I feel like there's less of a moment of epiphany there.、Mm-hmm. So I'm, I, I'm actually totally happy that like your your 
you know, trying to figure this out and you're taking time, even though at the moment, I'm sure uh, you must be to some extent frustrated that you're like, why isn't this doing the thing, right? And a lot of people are like, oh, you know, is there a bug here? Or, you know, is that supposed to look like, like, look like that? Or, or, you know, something that's, you know, not supposed to be blocking and actually blocking it, so. Mm -hmm. Um, real quick before I keep going, I'm just going to remind some folks in chat, we'd love to hear your questions for Albert. Uh, if you were making puzzle games or if you're making games like this, we want to know what you think, what you, uh, are, what you're working on, what challenges you're trying to solve in making them. Um, uh, man, to, mm -hmm. sorry, you were going to say? Yeah, I'm sorry. To like kind of expand on that answer a bit more, I think there are certain things that, you know, we're happy with if the players are... Kind of exploring as long as it doesn't uh it doesn't become frustrating to some extent right and mm -hmm. and those things are, are typically things that seem like they could work but they don't actually work so for example if you took that first box mm -hmm. and you went to the wall and you try to get up and if you did that like 40 times because you're like i just need it to be a little bit larger and it almost works like that feels really frustrating mm -hmm. but i'm you know i'm glad in, in this playthrough you took took that single box, put it over, and you're like, I'm not going to make this jump, so I don't even need to think about that. Yeah. I think that's kind of the best case scenario. You can just start crossing things off your list. Yeah. Man, it sounds, it sounds like you learned a lot from your playtesting about like what are acceptable like failed behaviors, I guess. Uh, yeah. Um, and it's, it's always kind of fun to see what people get stuck with, because sometimes you, know, you play with a lot, and you're like, oh, yeah, this mechanic is, totally makes sense, but some people... You know, don't realize you can grab things from afar, that you can project things from afar, and you end up realizing realizing that, you know, everybody will come with different expectations, so you need some kind of, like, getting process to make sure, uh, by a per certain point, everybody understands the basic mechanics. Yeah. Here's an interesting thought I had while, while um, solve, trying to solve this puzzle, is this is the, there's a little bit of a clambering mechanic, like, I just triggered it there. Um, yeah, but it only seems to after after I solved this puzzle, I realized it only seems to be functioning when the game is trying to like you know like uh, to quote another interview I did like when it's trying to make sure I'm solving the right puzzle, right? Like if right. this isn't a jumping puzzle game, you're not trying to time your jumps. The game is just trying to be nice to you when it knows you've done all the work. Um, but and here I was trying to abuse the clamber mechanic to get up on the <laughs> side. Um, uh, how did you time that out and keep like like your 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 helpful mechanics from interfering with your core gameplay yeah so uh the way we do it is really simple we, we have a ruler in in our game engine that we can just pull out and uh -huh. it basically says you know this is this is how high your first jump is this is how high your first jump plus like what we call like the mantling mechanic gives you and this is how high like two jumps give you so we know that if there's a ledge that requires, you know, at least two jumps, it's high enough that you can't uh, get up with just one object. And mm -hmm. that's mostly like, you know, from our designer, Logan, who kind of implemented that stuff and made sure that we were to, we were adhering to it, you know, pretty carefully. Because, um, right, because like, you could ease if it wasn't there, you could easily like get up there. Um, the other thing about the mantling system uh, is that I didn't realize it was, you know, a thing that was required before but because so usually in puzzle games you want really discrete states right mm -hmm. uh, and and what that means like you want people to know exactly when you've kind of achieved or, or failed a state and you don't want to keep it ambiguous so if they get it they immediately get it mm -hmm. um and if they don't they know they're not there um what's difficult about a game where you can resize stuff and and then this is something i've also discussed with um Steve Swink, because, you know, he's working on scale, mm -hmm. uh, is that it makes, for example, jumping on things much more difficult. So like in Portal, it's very easy to take one block and know that gives you a certain amount of height, right? Mm -hmm. But in this game, because uh, scaling is on, you know, and I don't know what you call it, it's, it's on a range. So it means that, you know, your jumping can also feel, feel uncertain at times like there's jumps without the mantling there's jumps that you think you can make but you actually can't uh and that just feels bad right so that's why in, in, in the end we decided that adding this mantling thing would help kind of make the game feel a lot more discreet help make it more easily understandable 
when you solve solve the puzzle or not. Yeah. Um, man, there's I just can't wait. Now that I'm so ha- I'm so happy we're past that because there are some really <laughs> cool puzzles uh, that I get to um, uh, show off to the audience. Um, that's really cool that you uh, are getting to talk to Steve Swink about this. I saw Scale at Indicate a while back. And yeah. I know he's still working on it. Um, so we're we're gonna. Um, how does it? I guess how is it? What is it like when? Um, this is not design related. I'm sorry, but what is it like to like get to like have someone out there be working on a similar mechanic as you? Um, and getting to share notes like that. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's really cool, and I think it's kind of like you know a healthy process, and um, and because it's a lot of times it's, you're not just dealing with similar kind of design problems, like oh, you know you're 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 talking about you know how to design puzzles. Mm-hmm. Some other times you're also talking about just like you know, what kind of art do you want to put in? What kind of story do you want to put in? How do you make things cohesive? And it, it does help to have uh, someone to bounce off ideas with that mm-hmm. kind of exists in the same space. So like, you know, Steve likes to talk about like, you know, practices that help you kind of work better, you know, just in terms of, uh, you know, he talks about like deliberate practice and stuff like that, which is really interesting, so. Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, this puzzle is also another. It, it stumps me for a moment, but then it gets super interesting. Oh, this puzzle was just so interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, especially, I'm going to point out there's a red, there's a window up to the top left that I looked at briefly. I don't. I, I later figured out I could make a thing, a platform to go up there, but I didn't, and I just proceeded onward. And I'm still wondering what's up by that red window because um, I didn't get to explore it when I was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, doing this puzzle myself. Um, diving into my question uh, ball pit. Um, uh, first person games like this, First, on the one hand, first person games have been super iterated on. We know a lot of things about making first person games that we didn't know in 1992, for instance. Um, one of them, which is a big deal for VR, is motion sickness, and I have to confess, I felt a little bit motion sick playing this game. Uh, and I think that had to do with just, you know, the human brain is very dumb, and when things change on us that aren't supposed to change, uh, they start getting weird. Um, what did you all learn about uh, designing around motion sickness, and did that come up like early, later, play testing? Like, was it a bigger problem than you expected? I'm just curious about that, just because I got a little bit motion sick. Yeah, I, I think it, this is always an interesting question, and then I, I think one of the big ones that we're actually trying uh, that we've implemented. Uh, that will probably be out in our next patch is mm-hmm. uh, an FOV slider, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of times, you know, mo- pe- people's motion sickness also depends on kind of how far uh, they are from the screen and what the FOV is and whether that matches kind of their na- their natural FOV. Mm-hmm. Um, besides that, we've tried different things, like because we we've also wondered if it's like, oh, this is something related to this game, right? Is it because you're grabbing this item and it's hard to identify whether uh, whether it's far or close, and if that's kind of messing up your brain, uh, one thing we realized that is that adding like a cursor in the middle actually does help because it helps people focused on kind of one point. Mm-hmm. At least that's one thing, and then the FOV slider as well. Um, yeah. Besides that, you know, we're still kind of trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. I, you know. I used to have pretty bad motion sickness, but also just like because I needed to work on this game so much, I kind of like lost a lot of that. So, for example, you know, when I played Portal, I would have to stop after every like hour or so, mm-hmm. you know, take a nap and then go back. Uh, but so part of it, I think, is, is somehow like repeat exposure, right? So yeah. I feel like people who haven't played video games also tend to have that to. Uh, a larger extent or somebody who's like watching over your shoulder mm-hmm. yeah um uh man i love this port i love the solution to this puzzle because uh, <laughs> it reminds me of the end of portal 2 um uh that's a interesting answer um let me see i'm going to uh Ask about um, what have you learned about teaching play? Like this is an interesting moment because like teaching players what can and can't be grabbed, teaching players what can expand and what can't. You're going to see some interesting um, variances on this in the next uh, thirty minutes or so. Um, what did you learn about sort of like about about that teaching process and about helping players like understand the new things they can do with this scaling power? Yeah. So there's a and, and that's a good question. That's actually 
a kind of design problem that we struggled struggled a lot with, right? Because mm -hmm. it's it's in this game in particular that is in this game in a big part is about thinking outside the box and giving you you those kind of unexpected surprises mm -hmm. uh, when you see things. So we try we also can't do you know very obvious things, right? So for example, if every grabble item had you know a shimmer to it. You know that would call it out. Then that also kind of destroys part of the surprise when we're playing the game. Mm -hmm. So you know this is a thing we've talked about internally, but we in, in the end we've tried basically two basic things that together they kind of help uh, make the problem a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is is through color, right? So um, there's things in the world that pop out a little bit more. There's things that uh, don't and generally we want people to uh, be able to be like oh that's the thing that's interesting I should be able to interact with it and you know theoretically they should right so if they see like oh there's a vending machine like because we see this a lot it's like oh there's a vending machine that's really interesting people walk up to it they want to like press the button so we do let them do that mm -hmm. and we've realized that it doesn't really need to be Every item that looks interesting, you can grab and resize. It just needs to be some like something happens, right? Mm -hmm. And if that happens, then people are satisfied and they know that they've done a thing. It kind of reacted to it, and then they can move on, as opposed to they try it and then and then you know they're a little bit disappointed. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we're trying to do is is kind of you know play with size a little bit, right? So uh, you know. We've talked about like color and trying to like blend things in things that don't really look grabbable, uh, probably aren't. And same with size, uh, smaller things that look like you can grab in your hand generally are grabbable. Um, of course, there's you know one a, a couple places that we try to break this rule so our puzzles don't you know get destroyed, <laughs> but we try to kind of abide that by that as well. So it feels kind of a little bit more intuitive. Yeah. This is a really interesting moment where like, like you're just getting all this messaging about perception is reality all of a sudden. And then you walk in the office, you're looking for something to grab and you turn around and the thing was right by the door when you grab, which is like the <laughs> least puzzly thing, but it's right. strangely uh, like you can't, unless you know it's there, you can't go grab it. Um, yeah. Such this level. Yeah. This level is fun. Cause this level is kind of like, a really fun uh, kind of twist on the on the other levels, because mm -hmm. um, one kind of one thing that we're playing along with is like the idea that you know, in a sense, we are are are, are trolling the player, but in in like a very tongue in cheek way, right? It's mm -hmm. so like if you see none of the puzzles in this particular level are super super difficult, mm -hmm. but they're more like things are you expect things to look totally normal, and then then they're not. And mm -hmm. that's kind of just the general theme of this level. Right on. Um, we're coming up on the half hour mark for our conversation. Um, uh, I sound like a broken record, but I genuinely do. We, we love hearing the thoughts of our developer audiences. God, that, that, this is when I started to get screwed up when that, I grabbed that die right there. <laughs> um, and I was like, wait a minute. Um, uh, so we'd love to hear your thoughts, your, uh, your questions for Albert. Um, I'm going to slightly tweak my line of questioning for the moment. Um, Albert, uh, so you, you took a mechanic that started as a student game, and then you and a bunch of friends got together. You got, you, you got a team together, and you said, uh, okay, we want to make this a shipped commercial product. Um, a lot of developers get to do that. It's a really cool thing about this industry. I don't know why I just wanted to play around with this. So I can. Um <laughs> Uh, what was it like, and what steps did you take? Did you think made it your your transition successful? Because there's a lot of devs who transition like their thesis games into commercial projects, and it just doesn't work out, or they have to go take a day job or something. How did you sort of make it all happen? Yeah, I mean, um, a big a big factor of that is is time, and of course, I don't think I don't think I did the process perfectly. Um, mm -hmm. I think one is time. That's why the game took, you know. You know, six years from beginning to end is because there was a lot of iteration. There was a lot of, you know, there's a point where I got some contract work in in order to make things work. Um, it wasn't, you know, of course, if I'm saying like, if we just sat down and we were, you know, totally funded and we had a full team, you know, we could have made this game a lot faster. But because of those basic kind of like, kind of transition moments, uh, indie games in general, I, I feel like. End up taking a little bit longer. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing, though, is just remembering kind of the initial wave of people who were interested in this game, and so you know, I was worried actually, maybe like the first year or year and a half working on the game that. If I didn't get the game out soon, that people would just forget about it. Mm-hmm. And and somebody told me that you know if people are interested in something uh, once, they will be interested in it and in it again. You know after it comes out or after the full thing is revealed. So I was kind of like hoping that you know I hope that's correct. I don't know, but mm-hmm. you know we'll test it out and see. Um, so a lot of it is that confidence that you know, this mechanic in this game would would be interesting enough that people would kind of uh, be attached to it again if the full thing ever came out, right? And that confidence, I think, especially you know when you're making any game, does help a lot because any any amount of certainty um, kind of makes things uh, easier mm-hmm. in a sense, right? Because when you're, when you're doing it, you know. As an indie or on your own, there's so many things that you're trying to uh, tackle with, or there's there's so many kind of you know doubts in your mind, right? Whether whether you'll ship the game and whether you know the game will even do well and stuff like that. So the more amount of certainties you can grab, kind of I feel like the easier that process is. So you're saying the certainty you're able to hold on to was like we have we have a mechanic that works, people are interested in it, and we will right that that yeah. will work for us tomorrow the same as it works today. Yes, yeah. Even if I showed somebody who'd never seen it before, they'd be like, "Oh, wow, this is really cool." Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. I admit that was me. <laughs> I feel like I, I I think I got it confused with scale when I first saw it because there's a house puzzle you that or there's a house puzzle yeah. later on that um uh is sort of similar to what's going on with scale. But um yeah, um moving on from that, um I guess as an indie, how did you manage your sort of quality of life in that time because, you know, 6 years is a long time to work on a game. Um, I hope it wasn't six years of long hours on one game because that would have been very hard. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm. I, I don't think I'm the best person to talk about this because I've been horrible at kind of keeping a good uh, work-life balance. Mm-hmm. And to me, because there's different types of people, and right? And some indies can just you know roll out of bed in the morning and get to work mm-hmm. and just have a very productive day. Um, I have personally like i have more trouble just like having a super productive day so that's what i i always try to shoot for mm-hmm. um and when you're at as in, you know doing this as an indie or by your own it's always hard to say like oh i need to wake up at you know this exact time and i need to you know do these things and then after this then you know i can take a break and then forget about everything and what i realized at least for me is that you know having a team of people around me you know people at our co-working space that you know i need to get up to bed to meet and to talk with that really actually helps me in my process right some mm-hmm. people need that some people don't um but i think having other people kind of on your team having other people that you know will be blocked by stuff if you're not there you know people that rely on you and and people you can rely on is is part of the process as well mm-hmm. right on um uh man i don't even solving this puzzle was very strange for me because i just sort of accidentally <laughs> uh walked into it um yeah uh um working with your team i guess like uh let's let's give us let's celebrate your coworkers for a minute because there's six you know team of six uh yeah you're not the only person making this happen um what are some of the interesting thing work what's some of the interesting work they did that you think is worth calling out yeah so okay so there's i mean it's like wh- where do i start right yeah um yeah so first of all there's logan who's our level designer um he worked on the game right before this that was called uh Side Fantasy, which is also a puzzle game, mm-hmm. but he also worked on uh, this Digipen uh, game called Perspective, uh, which is uh, this 2D platformer slash 3D first person game. It's, if, if that sounds interesting, you should go check it out. Um, it's on Steam right now. Um, but so he was like the perfect candidate to be, you know, a level designer on this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, couldn't have pick, picked anyone better. Um, other people, like, we have two artists on the team, uh, Ryan and uh, Steve. Uh, they both come from kind of more of a triple A background, but of course they've done some indie stuff, but 
they've had like tons of experience under, under their belt. You know, they've worked on, you know, World of Warcraft and and you know, Mortal Kombat and stuff like that. And you know, far more experienced than I am. Um, mm-hmm. There's Phil, who's who's our graphics programmer. You know, he's working on his own cool little game that uh, is called Snail Trick. Uh, mm-hmm. no, sorry, there's two games. There's Snail Trick, which he's released, but there's also Cascadia Quest, or Cascade Quest, or the name was changed at some point. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> sorry, Phil. <laughs> that that um, has a tons of cool stuff in it, too. Um, and he has tons of experience. You know, he, he worked at Microsoft for a while, uh, but now he's like doing really cool graphics stuff for a game. There's, you know, Chris Chris Floyd, who, you know, used to work for the Mega Booth mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, done co- ton, tons of cool stuff there. He's also doing some stuff for Oculus. Um, and there's, there's Al- Alex, who's also a programmer. He's, you know, I think a theme here is that um, because we're in kind of this co-working space, we can find the interesting people that we know to help us along with the project. It's mm-hmm. so like Alex is somebody we brought on, you know, a little bit late, late in the game, but he's kind of provided a lot of that kind of finishing touches in terms of the programming, like the UI and, and the controller and all that stuff that we really didn't have kind of a lot of time to tackle mm-hmm. at the end. So, you know, it's always nice to have like that kind of emergency kind of like programming, Warning. you know, muscle cord to pull, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a weird way to put it. Of course, there's, and, and last of all, there's like Matt Christensen, who's doing uh, the music for the game. And he's like this FMOD guru who also teaches, you know, jazz on the side. So, you know, that's why, you know, we brought him in because a lot of, uh, the music in this game is based off of like very uh, cool piano jazz, you know. Mm-hmm. And that was a kind of interesting atmosphere we were trying to build. So hopefully I didn't forget anyone. Right on. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, as, I, as I lament my past self for not being able to solve this puzzle, um, <laughs> I guess I can move on to my next question, which is um, uh, it is one thing always, you know, to ask uh, talented, smart people to come up with interesting games. Um, but it is, uh, another thing to then take people who are, you know, skilled at, uh, um, one aspect of making a game, like, you know, in your case, you made the demo and then to ask them to also lead a team. Um, is there anything, uh, uh, that you particularly thought of that, or in the last six years, is there anything notable about like leadership and working with other people that you've learned that you think other devs should know about? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the past six years for me, at least, is, is just a very long learning process. And, mm-hmm. and I'm still trying to learn and try to figure, you know, trying to figure things out. Um, um, among them, like, um, one of the big ones is at the beginning, maybe let's do it this way. Like, at the beginning, I had a couple of, of assumptions that, you know, turn out to be more nuanced than I thought. So, for example, um, coming in, you know, maybe in my student years, I would have said, you know, what's our goal? It's just to make a really, really good game. So I'm sure, you know, all of us will be able to make great decisions and saying what's a good game, what's not, just head in the right direction, right? Of course, that sounds like a, if that sounds like a recipe for disaster, that is. And it's because <laughs> um, everybody defines things a little bit differently, right? Mm-hmm. If you say, if you ask somebody what a good game is, they have different ideas, and and that doesn't necessarily mean anyone's wrong. It just means there's different ways of of, of seeing it, right? There's so many t- different types of games, so there's so many different types of w- types of ways where things can become good, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. And that a lot of times that requires emphasis on different aspects. So an artist might say, "Hey, to make this part good, we need high fidelity, or we need like some really cool, interesting." You know, one-off uh, art piece here, um, but to the this is designer, they may, might say like, "You know what? It's art's not super important to me. I just want something that's easily manageable. You know, I want to build out levels quickly." So, you know, everybody kind of has different expectations, and if you're lead, leading the team, the thing you're supposed to do uh, apparently is to try to get everybody on the same page of what's important and what's not important, mm-hmm. um, and you know. That's a process in itself, 
Um, and for that, it's difficult because then that you need to know or you have to have to have a good idea. And a lot of people, you know, end up needing to like, I don't, I can't really explain this perfectly, but, you know, based on my gut, we should probably go in this direction, you know, and a lot of it ends up being that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why I think like part of this process is so hard because the other thing though is also realizing that you know you're working with people who are really smart so generally they'll make the right decisions but that doesn't also because people have different tastes that doesn't mean that you know people will make the right decision really quickly so what do you need what can you do to kind of like help move that process along right mm -hmm. I used to maybe go like hey I would keep it open. I would say like, hey, just you know, do something cool that you really like for this area. But now I try to go, well, I'm trying to do this. You know, here's an example of this. You can improve on it. That's cool. But, you know, if not, maybe we should do something, you know, simpler for this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something on those lines. That was really thoughtful. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I love how really serial killer this this is. <laughs> yeah, um, that's all Logan. Nice. Nice job, Logan. I hope I hope you're I hope you're watching. Um, and uh, I hope you I hope I hope uh, I hope you got to hear that compliment kind of way. Um, uh, right on. Um, once I guess like something that actually kind of can get overlooked. You mentioned having two talented artists on this game. Um, what kind of art style did you sort of realize you needed in order to make sure that this puzzle game could be both like easy to read and also something you could fill out with like the sense of space and narrative, which I don't even think we're going to have time to talk about the narrative today, but like there is kind <laughs> of a, there's kind of an, or, there's kind of a something like it's not, you're not just dealing with puzzles in an abstract space. This whole wandering through a dream facility thing is really seems well, well intentioned. Is there anything you figured out as working with your artists that you really needed that in this process? Yeah. So um you know we took a we took a, a look at a lot of indie games like you know let's say starting with antechamber we're like we don't want to do something completely purely abstract even though that makes things read a lot easier right mm -hmm. and part of that reason is that when you're in the actual mundane space it's just things are so much funnier if you make them if you if you make make things surreal and like if you move you know make a can of soda really large like that's a kind of funny moment that you can't have in a purely abstract space. Um, on the flip side, we also didn't want a very busy looking space, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, as, as you mentioned, yeah, that just ends up distracting. And especially in a puzzle game, uh, that draws you to a lot of false uh, clues that aren't exactly there. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end, we kind of um, went for this art style that, you know, our one of our ref reference points was uh, Wes Anderson because things are kind of clean and clear, but there's still this interesting surreal tone going on. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a heightened reality, right? Like you wouldn't necessarily see these colors in real life, but they could exist. So there's that, it kind of lies on that kind of uh, line between uh, sur surreal, you know, something something that's possible, but also a little bit magical. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, similar with, with the mechanic as, as well and, and the, you know, the items in the game and, and, and the puzzles, that's kind of the line we're trying to hit. And I, and you know, I think that feels a lot more, more funnier and, and more surreal than, because then, you know, the extreme, right? Mm -hmm. There's the other extreme you could go to that we didn't go to is if we made things very fantastical, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that would be like, you know, if you're in some kind of fantasy world and you're, you have this mechanic because you have like a special, you know, magical ancient magnifying glass or something. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know, but uh, it's just a lot of it. Kind of just kind of depends on kind of what kind of game or tone you're trying to shoot for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, for the looks, you know, we were referencing Wes Anderson. We were re referencing you know things like James Terrell, which used a lot of kind of pastel colors. Um, there's this great kind of subreddit called Accidental Accidental Wes Anderson. It's where people take photographs that look like Wes Anderson stuff, and mm -hmm. then you know they just post it and and share. Um, and basically, we we kind of like took a lot of those elements and we try to analyze how those elements worked, right? Mm -hmm. And 
and a lot of it is, is about the color and about the level of detail. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm really glad that you know it, it came out in a style that we we could work with design, but it's also interesting to look like look at. Right on. Uh, this is where uh, unfortunately poor old past me started getting a little confused about what was going on. Um, lastly, I guess we can, uh, as we head into our last part of our chat, um, we can talk about the Epic Game Store a little bit. Um, this is a big new store. Developers are still trying to figure out why they should be shipping on it, if they should be shipping on it exclusively. Um, some developers are trying to figure out, uh, how their player bases, potential player bases will react. Um, can you walk us through your process about, uh, shipping Superliminal on the store? And if there's anything in particular you think other de developers need to know? Yeah, um... I don't think there was too many things that like we ran into. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's a couple of kind of features that uh, aren't there yet, and that's both a blessing and a curse, right? So, for, for example, for a ship, we didn't need to put in achievements, um, and that's great because that would have like, you know, took us another you know week or two to kind of kind of like put everything in test everything. Mm -hmm. um, besides that, I think. I think the the kind of general process is streamlined enough that nothing in particular was like incredibly different, and, and mm -hmm. I'm glad that's the case. That you know we have you know different PC platforms that don't feel like you're you're porting to a completely different console or anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's no uh, super long process that you need to go through. Um, it's basically similar to more or less similar to how you would put a game on Steam. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What other experience did you have putting a game on Steam, if you don't mind me asking, like how, it, like that you're able to compare it against? Yeah, so basically, well, uh, you know, before we got, we got on the App Game Store, we were on Steam for a little while, and that was a way that we could get the game kind of tested um, and, and playable in an easy format so we we're actually using steam for for a little bit of time um before we did that and you know the process like each storefront will have their own process right but it's more like you just you need to go in and figure out but after you do generally it's it's relatively straightforward mm -hmm. yeah this um you know what's not straightforward this puzzle <laughs> <laughs> as you can see yeah. me desperately trying to click my way this is one of those interesting cases where where I could tell I was just trying to brute force it, but I didn't know what the elegant, what the uh, right. elegant solution yeah. was. Um, so we will see me in a minute here. I, this was me, like I'd just gone on and I watched a YouTuber try to solve it. Oh. Um, and I think he'd come up, he'd actually managed to get this this sort of solution to work. He managed to click it up the hill all at once. Yes. Yeah, I've seen people do things that were not intended, yeah. but are very interesting. Like, oh, okay, that's actually something I need to fix. But some of them, you know, yeah. are just cool. When do you when do you draw that line? When do you fix something that uh, you didn't intend as a puzzle, and when do you just let it be? Yeah, I think um, that really comes down to the player experience. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a thing that you know leads them to be more frustrated, generally we will try to fix it. But if it's like a cool thing, for example, a lot of people like taking items and try to like find really weird kind of nook and crannies in the game that they weren't supposed to. Mm -hmm. and for that we do want to encourage so we will be kind of patching the game and adding more easter eggs and things you can discover that you know encourage that sort of behavior right because basically when players do that you know i feel like they're putting you know extra effort in, in, into the game and it'd be nice if you know as a player it'd be nice if i was rewarded if i did this crazy thing that wasn't supposed to happen Mm -hmm. that got somewhere that you know i wasn't supposed to go and if there's a sign over there that says like you know why did you do that you know that that's kind of like an acknowledgement that it happened so we, we try to kind of encourage that kind of stuff god i'm so close i'm just watching my past <laughs> and i'm just like all i need to do is take a step back take a step back there you go <laughs> oh man that's the problem with doing some of these like recorded streams is you just look back at what you're doing you're like i get it now <laughs> and you just think about what you like when you didn't get it. Um, well, uh, with that in mind, um, I believe I am running out of questions for the moment. Um, I guess I will end on one final... Oh, there's... <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, 
Albert, I guess, is there any particular lesson, um, you know, this, this is Game Developers Conference, um, we, we do things with other game developers in mind, is there anything Warning, you'd like other Dr. game developers Pierce to know before you wrap up today? Yeah, there's me getting more frustrated. Into the <laughs> um, in a I mean, you. not that much, I but I think, if anything, I just want to talk, talk about kind of like, you the know, the, the pre-production process, and I think that it's actually kind of they would not make sense a very hard thing to figure out. I think I think kind of games in general aren't super good at that because just because of how games are, like you kind of need to make something in order to figure it out mm -hmm. if it works. But I feel like if you can grab on something early on, like, you know, even in a very broken state, you know, of this game, there was something there that we could point to and say, you know, that's something people will be interested in even, I don't know, like four or five years later when the game is complete. Having that and having having something like that and having the confidence kind of does help you along the way. Um, and yeah, and just like try to try different things during pre-production. It's not necessarily just, you know, keep on building the game. Sometimes it's taking a step back. Sometimes it's building a different kind of prototype or, or, or in a different medium. You know, going to paper or 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 something else. We're talking to people um, in order to kind of get to where you need to be in order to uh, really start production. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm just saying that because we we kind of went between pre-production and production a couple of times before realizing kind of where that line was at. I'm sure. No, a lot of people have been in similar situations. Um, really quick, um, Christopher Conditions Floyd says this game is the sale of indie games. Hi, Chris Floyd. Um, uh, man, I love the loading screens real quick. This is when I realized the loading oh, screens yeah. were getting weird. Um, before we go, <laughs> Natal420 has jumped in with a question. Um, and I think we've sort of covered this, but we can I can ask it and we can sort of revisit the topic um, for a moment. Um, uh, was this game designed uh, to have only one answer uh, per puzzle? Or did, did you ever want people to solve the puzzle through multiple means? Um, uh, they comment that they uh, were thinking about Zelda shrines in Breath of the Wild. Um, not Zelda, they're not called Zelda shrines, they're just called shrines. They're, they're shrines <laughs> in Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Um, and how they've seen multiple solutions to each shrine. I'm going to layer on that question by pointing out that sometimes in those shrines, the multiple solutions are often people like gaming the the wild physics mechanics of that game um and this game uh is different it doesn't have wild physics mechanics but um yeah i guess what was your i've noticed that there seems to be only one solution per puzzle but what was your yeah. thought process behind making that decision yeah we were also at some point trying to figure that out right do we want this to be more of you know a straight up puzzle game or do we want it to have you know more freedom and more of a sense of creativity uh and more toy like and then we said no no creativity for you um but i think the real answer is it depends on kind of what you really care about and for our game we really cared about giving people kind of moments of epiphany mm -hmm. and that's harder to do if you have multiple solutions right mm -hmm. because what you end up doing is maybe you you know have a different epiphany and you skip this moment you skip this thing that we're trying to tell you and in the next puzzle you get stuck right mm -hmm. so uh for us at least we've kind of chosen the one solution per puzzle uh, way but if people do you know similar to the zelda shrines if people do find like a crazy solution um that they're just ahead of the curve we don't we try not to pe penalize them for that so mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is one of my favorite yeah. puzzles actually this house Love awesome, house. yeah, I love, thanks. I love, I love going, I love reshaping the sizes of things and then going inside <laughs> them. Like taking the, the small thing and making it big. Taking the small door and making it big. Yeah. It's very Alice in Wonderland. Exactly, Which yeah. Normally I would not use that as a compliment, but here it's a compliment. <laughs> Um, with that, I'm going to start wrapping things up. Thank you, everyone, for watching the GDC Twitch channel today. If you uh, didn't catch the whole stream, don't worry. It's going to be archived. Um, there, see, look at this. Look at this tiny door I have to figure out how to get into. Um... Uh, um uh this um 
Uh, this has been our chat with uh, Albert Chi of the Pillow Castle Games uh, for work, uh, the game Superliminal. Um, you can check it out on the Epic Games Store if you want to play it for yourself. Um, for our part, uh, GDC is coming up in March uh, from the 16th to the 20th, to be precise. You might have noticed that if you looked at the screen for two seconds. Um, uh, we would like to invite you to join us at GDC um, in part because, you know, we... We cater to game developers, we cater to people, uh, students, professionals, indie developers. We like having you all at the show uh, because it's a lot of knowledge sharing, it's a lot of networking, um, and it's a lot of stuff, it's a lot of places, it's a place where you can have a lot of conversations like this conversation where you just try to learn from the people making great work in your field. Um, if that clumsy sales pitch uh, did anything for you, uh, you can scroll down and click the button to get more information about registration. Um, and if you are otherwise just interested in the way games get made, we would invite you to follow the GDC Twitch channel so that you can uh, keep up with the other developers we're going to be talking to this month and next year. Um, this month, I can promise you, if you stick around, you're going to be hearing from the developers behind the new Mech Warrior game, which is out um, out later this month. Um, we're also going to be talking to the folks behind Age of Empires 2 Remastered, uh, Definitive Edition, not Remastered, Definitive Edition. Uh, and uh, if you want to hear more about from those folks, just follow us and you'll get a notification when we go live. Albert, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Superliminal's a cool game. I hope you have a lovely day. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. With that, I will take us home. Bye, everyone. Bye.